fellow bookmakers, this is a note before I start. After I recorded everything I wanted to share for part two, it turned out to be quite long. So I have had to split this part two itself into two parts. This video is the first part of part two, and then I'll make another video to finish up. Welcome, or welcome back. This video recounts my method for creating a children's book and picks up where part one left off. As I noted at the beginning of part one, this video does not give you advice on story ideas or tips on writing or making art. This video assumes you have that part handled and provides one process, the one I use for assembling those assets into a finished product printed by a printer that works with self-publishing authors. This isn't the only way and might not work for everyone, but listening to my process might be informative to you on your journey. This is part two of two, which covers the construction of the print files after you have your art and text ready to go. Part one covered the planning of the book block and cover so you could begin or finalize work on your art and text. Here is where you should be in order to be ready for this video to be useful to you. You know your trim size and page count. You've made all your interior art. Your text is finalized or all but final. You've downloaded your cover template and gathered or created the elements you'll need for it, such as art, text, and ISBN. Before I start walking you through the next steps, let me tell you what your final objective is. You are going to create two PDF files, one for the cover and one for the book block. You will then give these to your printer, probably by uploading them through your printer's website. Your printer will print the cover and book block separately and then attach them together. That is why there must be two separate PDF files. This is different from if you're making an ebook. I should note that this video does not cover how to build an ebook. This video is for preparing print files for a physical copy that you can hold in your hands. It doesn't matter which PDF file you work on first, the cover or book block. And the first step is the same for both. You must get all of your assets into digital format, because whether you did your art and text traditionally or digitally, Everything from here on out will be done on a computer. Maybe you made your art digitally, in which case that's ready. But if you made your art traditionally, like with acrylics, watercolors, colored pencils, collages, mixed media, whatever, you need to get it into digital files. If your art is already digital, you can skip ahead. This bit is for those with traditional art. The most common way of making your traditional art into digital art is to have the art scanned, though you could also have it professionally photographed, especially if your art is too big to fit on a scanner. If you have access to a scanner or high quality camera and suitable lighting, you can do it yourself, or you can take it to a service shop or professional and pay for their services. If you have a scanner hooked up to your own computer, and are accustomed to scanning in your artwork, you probably know what you're doing and don't need my advice at all. In fact, if you scan things a lot, you might know more than I do about getting good scans. But for those who don't, here's some advice. There are some specifications to consider when turning traditional art into a digital form. If you're paying someone else to do it, they should know but I caution you that I have taken my art into local print and copy shops where the employees did not know how to handle and properly scan art. You may have to tell them exactly what you want. Do not assume they know. If you go to a specialty art scanning shop instead and just tell them what you're doing with the art, they will probably do it right, though you will pay more. If you're familiar with image files, You'll know that they have elements such as dimension in inches or centimeters or whatever, resolution, which is usually called DPI. 
color space, which may be CMYK, RGB, bitmap, or grayscale, and so on, and compression, depending on file type. You'll need to specify these, except for dimensions, which should be the same size as your art pieces, when scanning. As for file type, you may be aware of file types such as JPEG, GIF, TIFF, PNG, and PDF. There are others as well, such as Photoshop's own format, Photoshop RAW, Illustrator files, EPS, the list goes on. You'll have a limited selection for scanning your art into. Here is what I suggest. If you have made your art just slightly bigger than your trim size, as I suggested in part one, scan your art at 300 DPI into a format with low to no compression such as PNG or TIFF, if available. Compressing the art can potentially lose data and degrade your image, so I don't recommend it. JPEGs have compression. PNGs usually don't. PDF could be fine, but PDFs may store the images within them as JPEGs. And yes, I know I said we're ultimately making PDFs at the end of all this, but you don't want to introduce compression this early in the process. If the scanner gives you the option to set the amount of compression within whatever file types it offers, always set it as low as possible. If it uses the term compression ratio, you also want this set as low as possible. If it uses the term quality, which is sometimes used with JPEGs, set this as high as possible. Turn off any auto brightening or auto contrast in the scanner settings. Do not use any kind of filter. If the scanner gives you an option to scan it as text or photo, choose photo. Always scan full color, even if your art is black and white. Bitmaps are almost always a bad idea for art. If your scanner offers a choice between RGB and CMYK, scan an RGB. Wait, wait, you say. I gave a huge rant about never using RGB back in part one. Yes, you're right, I did. But scanning it in as RGB is more likely to pick up more colors because RGB has a wider gamut or range. Your final product will be printed in CMYK, but don't eliminate colors from your art now. Your objective at the scanning stage is to retain as much data from the art as possible. You will adjust brightness, contrast, change file formats and color spaces later, but don't do it at this stage. Scanners are blunt instruments and you want to take away their ability to modify or degrade your art. You will adjust your art later in an image processing program that will give you much more control over how it's done. These files you make from the scanner will be big because they'll be containing as much data as possible with as little compression as possible. You'll need to bring a flash drive or thumb drive or jump drive or whatever you prefer to call them with you if you're going out somewhere to have this done. Make sure there are several gigs of space on the drive available for your files. Now, if you followed my advice, you set up your interior art in spreads when you created it. Two pages, side by side, as they'll appear in the final book. Do you scan them in spreads or as separate pages? I suggest separate pages unless the art crosses the gutter. Why? A couple reasons. That will make the file sizes smaller, so there will be less burden on your computer when you're working with them, and you will probably want to nudge the pages around separately in your design document, which you can't do if they are married to each other at the gutter. Okay, what if your art is not the same size as your trim size? If your art is bigger, I still suggest you scan at 300 dpi and then shrink it once you start working with it digitally. If your art is smaller, 
I mentioned before that you cannot stretch art to make it bigger without degrading its quality. Here is a trick around that. Scan it at higher than 300 DPI. DPI. What is DPI and why is this important? I'm sure you can find videos that explain DPI in detail, but I'm not here for that. Go look it up if you're curious, and it is good to know, but I'm going to keep it simple. Professional printers usually print at around 300 DPI. It's a standard resolution. If you submit art that is less than 300 DPI to your printer, they will probably reject it. Of course, you can take any image and just manually go into a menu and change its resolution to 300 DPI in name only to get around this, but that will not improve the image's quality. It's similar to using digital zoom on a camera. Yes, the image gets bigger, but it's gritty and blurry and full of artifacts from where the computer invented data to make the image bigger. Taking an image scanned at 200 dpi, for example, and just telling the computer to make it be 300 dpi is the same thing. The computer will invent data to increase the resolution, but that invented data will not be as good as what your eye could see, or what the scanner would have recorded if you had scanned at a higher dpi. But if printers print at 300 dpi, why would you need to scan at higher than 300 dpi? If you have a digital file that is higher than 300 dpi, you can increase its physical dimensions in inches or centimeters or whatever, and watch the dpi drop until you hit 300 dpi, and then stop. There's this thing called resampling that happens when you take an image and stretch it larger, and like I said, you it can make your image look like junk if the computer has to invent new data. But if you scan at, say, 600 dpi, you can enlarge the dimensions of your image to twice its size without the image getting degraded because no new data is being invented. You can think of dpi like the concentration of a gas or a liquid. Scanning at 600 dpi double concentrates your image so then you can enlarge it afterwards to be twice as big. It will make the file size much larger if you scan at 600 dpi, however. So, you've scanned your art. Here's your next step. Once I get my files of all my art images, I put them in Photoshop for cleanup and adjustments. If you don't have Photoshop, you might manage by getting GIMP off the internet which is a free image manipulation software. There are others on the market too, but I have Photoshop, so that's what I use. I am not here to give a Photoshop tutorial. If that is education you need, you will have to seek out other sources for it. So you take your images, put them in Photoshop, clean them up, trim them, adjust the brightness and contrast and color if needed. I suggest lowering the brightness on your computer screen considerably. On my Mac, I lower it all the way to before it goes black. Screens are very bright and can blow out light colors so you can't see them. But printed materials will always be darker than what you see on your screen, and those fainter colors might be visible then. If you reduce the brightness, you may be able to see additional imperfections or variations of color that need your attention. Keep in mind that very dark colors may print as black, and very light colors may still print as white, so try to keep your lights and darks closer to the center of the spectrum. A printer simply cannot reproduce everything the human eye can see. Here, while you're in your image manipulation program, is where you will change the color space if you scanned your art in RGB. I recommend using CMYK as the color space for the rest of the process. If your images are all in black and white, and you have specified that the interior of your book is to be printed in black and white, 
leave your images in grayscale. Do not use bitmap as that will get rid of all your shades of gray and probably be rejected by your printer. Also, if you did as I suggested and made your art slightly larger than your trim size, do not reduce the size of your art yet. Keep it a bit bigger. You'll reduce its size once you have placed it into the design file, which happens later. Keeping it bigger gives you more flexibility when you finally do place that file. If you're adding additional design elements to your art, not text, we are not dealing with text yet, put them in now. For example, I scan my black and white line art and add color in Photoshop. I will also sometimes draw additional elements and color them in in Photoshop. This will create additional layers in your file. When you're done and the art looks just how you want it, save it and then flatten the image. I do recommend saving the layered file in case you need to go back and make changes. Save your flattened file as a PSD file if you're in Photoshop or a non-compressed PNG file in color space CMYK. Other file types like JPEG are viable, just be sure you save them with as little compression as possible. If you are working with a digital vector file in software such as Adobe Illustrator, there are a couple other steps you'll need to take. When your art is final, I suggest outlining all your strokes including any text you might have used, and then saving a copy of your AI file in EPS format instead. That way you can adjust the size of your art in the design file and the strokes and text will scale like any other element in the art. So now you have a bunch of pieces of finished art for your cover and interior. As mentioned, these don't include any text yet, nor does the cover art have the ISBN code on it or the title text, unless you included the title as part of your artwork. If you haven't already, I suggest you name your prepared and flattened interior art files by page number. This is just for organizational purposes. It's how I like to do it so I don't get confused about what goes where when I'm building my design file, but you can, of course, name them however you want, whatever works for you. The next step is to begin combining the elements, your prepared art and text, into the final two design files, which will become your two PDFs. You will now make two files. It doesn't matter which you do first. One will be the book block, You'll make that one in Adobe InDesign or some other similar graphic design and layout software. The other file will be for your cover, which you may have the option of creating in Photoshop or in InDesign or in similar sorts of software. Again, I am not here to give a tutorial on how to use software. You'll have to go elsewhere for that kind of instruction, but I will point out the particulars of using it for book construction. I'll start with the book block. You'll set up a file in InDesign. Your printer might provide you a template, but in my experience it's more likely there will be a guidebook that covers the parameters you'll need to set up to meet their requirements. You should go fetch that and read it. My guidance here will be based off of my experience with Ingram Sparks guidebook. I make a new file, specifying how many pages I need and their dimensions. These are my total page count, including any blank pages at the beginning or end, title pages, copyright pages, etc. And the trim. For Ingram Spark at least, the page count must be an even number only. When I set it up, I have the option to include bleed. And yes, I want that because my art goes all the way 
off the edges of the pages. I also specify that I want my pages displayed as spreads, which is usually the default. You can probably leave the margins alone. They should default to being a half an inch from the edge of the pages. As you're setting up your document, if this is your first time working with design software, you may notice this strange P used for increments. That's the pika. Software is usually smart enough that if you type your measurements followed by IN for inches or CM for centimeters, the software will convert it to picas for you. You can also change what units you want used for dimensions in your settings or preferences. You do not need to specify DPI or color space for this document because those are contained in your image files that you will place into this document. Here in InDesign, you will not be creating any new art. You will only be combining your art with your text and adjusting all of your elements in relation to each other. Your first page will always begin on the right, even if your actual story begins on a left-facing page, as mine often do later in the document. Why on the right? Because when you open a book, the first page after the cover is on the right. Some specialty printers may have other options for you, but I'm not covering any of those here. Look back at the plan you made after part one of this video series. You decided on a page count that included things like title pages, a copyright page, dedication page, and so on, before your story starts. I suggest you begin adding those elements to the appropriate pages in your document, working from front to back, using the tools available in your software. You can make text boxes and type directly into them, or you can cut and paste into them from any other text program like Microsoft Word or a cloud-based word processing document, or even something as simple as your computer's notepad or wordpad programs. There is even a way to link a Word document to a text box or boxes in InDesign. But because a children's book has so little text compared to, like, a novel, and because you might be manipulating the text boxes a lot, I think linking the text causes more problems than benefits. If you don't know what I mean by linking the text, don't worry about it. I will shortly be showing you how I link images, which is similar in idea. You're going to build your book in the sequential order of the pages. Now, you might be thinking, but the printer, they're going to resort my pages, right? Because of the way the paper is folded in the book, page one is really sharing a sheet with page 40. No, don't worry. Just stop those fears. You build your book block in sequential order, like the final book will look. So page two is across from page three, page four is across from page five, and so on. Don't worry about how the printer does their job. You build your book block like this, and they will take care of the rest. As you start working on your title page and so on, you will need to select your fonts and font sizes. Make sure you aren't using any fonts that are copyright protected, unless you have the permission of the creator. Most fonts that came with your computer should be fine to use, but if you went online and found some unique font somebody made and posted, that font belongs to them. You need to get their permission to use it in a book you intend to sell, unless they have stated that it's free to use for any purpose. So what font to pick? In general, serif fonts, those are the ones that have little tails off the letters and look more traditional, like Times New Roman, for example, look more formal, and are easier to read when you have large blocks of text. You should avoid script fonts and other special fonts in general, as they tend to be harder to read. Sans serif fonts look more casual and friendly, and are often easier to read on a screen. The standard font size for documents produced for adults is usually around 11 or 12 point. 
although newspapers and paperback books often use smaller fonts. For a children's book, you might want to go a little larger, except for the copyright page, which most kids won't care about reading. InDesign has a feature that makes keeping track of your fonts easy. It's called paragraph styles. If you've built websites, paragraph styles are sort of like CSS. It's a style sheet that allows you to apply a given style of text, font, size, spacing, and so on, repeatedly throughout your document without having to do it manually each time. So I suggest you play with it a bit to get used to how it works. It will make your multi-page interior file much easier to format. When you've finished your title pages and so on, you'll get to the start of your story. You can also always come back and work more on your title pages later. But once you know where your first story page will start, place your art for the first page into the appropriate page. Do not cut and paste. Use the function within your software that allows you to place the art. In InDesign, it is actually called placing. This creates a link to the actual file, but does not burden InDesign with having the actual art file within it. If you realize there's something wrong with the art, you can go back to the actual art file, change it, save it, and the placed art will be updated within your InDesign file. This also prevents the InDesign file from becoming enormous in terms of file size. Note that the image you'll see, for now, in your InDesign file will look gritty or blurry. That's because it's a preview image, and if you have linked the art correctly, you don't have to worry. That's not how the final PDF will look. The final PDF will have the full quality image. To be sure your image is happily linked, look into the Links menu. If there is a problem with any of your images, you'll get an alert icon, such as an exclamation point, beside the image name. Now, when you place your image into your file, it will drop in at 100% of its size. Here, you can resize it as needed, keeping in mind that if you increase its size, you will be degrading the image quality. Because this image you see in InDesign is only a preview image, you can resize it many times without harming your actual art file at all. You can flip it on any axis, rotate it, or delete it if you realize you don't need it, and you will not hurt your original art file. That is the beauty of linking your art to your design file.